Welcome back, lovely viewers. A viewer sent me this. It was a link to this guy called Steve Blank. The viewer, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> I deleted your comment and your link, but it was a link to a talk that this character, Steve Blank, gave at the History of Computing Museum in Silicon Valley. Steve is a lecturer in startup at the Business College in Berkeley, but he shares a passion with me. He's passionate about secret history, especially into World War II and to um, spy technology. Steve makes this intriguing statement. He says, every World War II movie gets it wrong. Oh, <laughs> that got me hooked. So let's look at what he was talking about. Daylight One, this is Daylight Leader, IP. Start your bomb run. Make it good. Pilot to Bombardier, PDI Center, she's all yours. Target clear. Bombs away. That was very much the classic World War II film. Target clear. Bombs away. But in fact, most of Europe in World War II was cloudy. But bombing missions continued. How they did it was secret until now. <laughs> right down their throats, Colonel! The Allies had downward facing radar that could paint a rough picture of the shape of a factory or a city so they could bomb places at night and on a cloudy day. But we weren't the only ones with secret radar technology. Not discussed at the time, but now revealed, Germany had a sophisticated early warning system, consisting of layers like an onion of radars, some looking out to the North Sea, some watching aircraft over land, in a cellular structure that could detect and release German fighters to attack the bombers. Unfortunately, the Germans also had radar controlling their flak. Flak batteries had a central radar that could control multiple guns. So the true picture of a daylight bombing raid is not a bunch of brave guys in a plane, but in fact multiple aircraft, lots of electronic warfare went on in the 1940s. Now you might have heard of a proximity fuse. Now the idea is when you're firing a shell up into the air, you have to set the height that it explodes. Well, it either hits something and explodes or it, you can set the height to make it explode near your target, say an aircraft. Well, that's really inaccurate. For example, if you see all these classic World War II movies where you see poof, 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 black puffs of flak and the aircrafts are flying around, they miss the aircraft. Okay, sure, big bits of shrapnel comes out and you know you could be damaged with it, the horrible stuff. But just imagine if you could fire a shell from the ground up past the aircraft and when it got as close as it knew to the aircraft, it explodes. I um, mean, that would be amazing. You know, it would auto adjust and that's called proximity. And it was assumed that that was carefully set on the ground. It wasn't. The truth is amazing. One of the major advancements in ordnance to emerge from World War II is the VT, or proximity fuse. A top secret project during the war, the details of construction and operation are still a secret. Some of its unique properties, however, may now be described. The simplest form of artillery or bomb fuses explode their carriers after impact with the target. These targets could be engaged more effectively if the projectile would explode when it came close. If the fuse could know when it was within damaging distance of the target. Such a fuse had been dreamed of for many years. How a proximity fuse actually works is by radar with a microwave sensor in its nose. So it knew a field around it that if anything echoed back, it was sending out a small microwave signal, and if anything got into that field, poof, it would go off. That 
was a absolutely game changer for the Allies. And it was very much thanks to scientists in radar labs who are working on tracking technology that managed to miniaturize a, quite a basic little microwave sender in the nose cone of a shell that brought about the so-called proximity fuse. Literally one of the things that won World War II. The army fuse referred to in the European theater as POSIT first saw action in the defense of London against the flying bomb attack of June to August 1944. The VT fuses and American fire control equipment were supplied to both the British and the United States anti-aircraft guns deployed in the operation. VT helped save London, and it is a very real reason why many a London landmark is still standing and why many a London home is still inhabited this truly great achievement of our scientific and industrial organizations. And the second thing he talks about is another one of my passions, Jodrell Bank. The amazing radio telescope just south of Manchester here in Europe. It was completed with government money because it was going to be used as a spy technology to look at Sputnik and Soviet launches in the late 50s. So what Steve explains about Jodrell Bank is fascinating. I'd heard the story that it was funded to be completed by government money or military money because of the launch of Sputnik. And they talk about um, how they used it to look at the um, missile which actually put Sputnik into orbit. And that's as far as I've ever heard. Well, here's the bigger story. What they did was they pointed Jodrell Bank to the area that missiles were being tested. And sure enough, they would get the actual missile, a bounce of the missile taking off. But what they really found was all the Russian radar stations would be tracking their Russian missile and they would pick up the signal of all the radars pinpointing where they were located. And that's what they really wanted to know. If you know where your enemy's radars are, you can avoid them, know a bit about how they work, jam them, and um, that was the true story. On this channel, we've talked a lot about spy technology with cameras in space looking down at us. But it turns out that signal intelligence is even more important. If you look at the SR-71 or ox cart that we know as the spy plane, sure, it had a camera, but most of that fuselage was actually filled with signal intelligence equipment. It was vital to know what our enemies actually had in the form of radar and how it worked. The other thing that Steve talks about is the history of Silicon Valley. Today, we see it making for-profit consumer items, but in fact, in the 1950s and 60s, it was Microwave Valley. It was getting massive contracts from the military to make microwave and radar technology for spies. Thanks, Steve. That was brilliant. I really enjoyed learning about secret operations in World War II and in the Cold War. Thank you so much. And it's because of you, we know now that the truth is out there. I found this amazing film about strategic air command, and I just have to share it with you as a bonus. This is proper hand-drawn animation. I just love it. I mean, this clip has to be the, one of the most classic clips about the Cold War and the threat of nuclear attack. Watch this. The time, tomorrow. The place, a hostile nation. The 
weapons, intercontinental range ballistic missiles in hardened sites. we face. But we are not asleep. Night and day, our satellites and radars are on guard. The Midas satellite detects hostile missiles shortly after launch and relays the information through a ground station to alert BMUs, NORAD, and the Aerospace Defense Forces of the Free World. BMUs, the ballistic missile early warning system tracks the hostiles. When they have attained sufficient altitude, BMUs identifies the launch and impact areas. And our early warning radars detect hostile aircraft. Their intelligence is sent to the North American Air Defense Command, the Strategic Air Command, and the Pentagon by landline, radio, and communication satellites, transmitting information that the unknown missiles are hostile. Orders go out to launch our striking force of supersonic bombers, intercontinental and air-launched ballistic missiles, and to defend ourselves with supersonic interceptors missiles and anti-missile missiles. systems become even more sophisticated in speed and accuracy and destructive power, time plays an increasingly important role. As long as we can buy time with communications, we can stay ahead. When the life or death of a nation can be counted in minutes, then every second, every microsecond counts.